ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on our program. As always, we have these outstanding individuals. We're doing outstanding work out there, especially in the literary world. And there's one person that I admire, that I respect a great deal. And I look forward to talking to him because of his influence, not only in his own work, but to help others, to move others into the world of bringing their stories to the surface. Daniel Olivas. Now, it's very special for me to say Olivas because my dad was Olivas. También. Oh, my so goodness. He was, he was from Arizona to California, from Mexico up north. So I, I, I'm part of the Olivas family. And so we're not related as far as I know up to today, but we might be. You never know here on this planet anyway. <laughs> yeah. But Daniel Olivas has always had the impression that he wants people to tell their stories. And I picked up his 10th book, uh, the, How to Date a Flying Mexican. That flying Mexicans. Wait a minute. What is this about? So anyway, I said, Daniel, what are you talking about? So I thought instead of inventing my own answer, we'd bring in the author and let him talk about it. <laughs> Daniel, un aplauso on your book. <laughs> you know how to date a flying Mexican. <sighs> what the heck are you talking about? Well, you know, first of all, Armando, thank you so much for having me and all that you do for for the culture and the community. Um, you know, how to date a flying Mexican, new and collective stories basically um, is an overview of almost 25 years of some of my favorite stories um, with a couple additional new ones. And I think it kind of captures um, some of the more unusual stories I've written um, over the years. One moment you have me laughing, next moment you have me like in terror, next moment I says, where is this going? Next moment I'm scaring myself. It's just like, oh my God. But I always say this, you know, I remember Familia talking about this or mentioning this or doing that. All of a sudden, I'm connecting a lot of my background, 70 years of my background. I find my life, my culture in your stories. How did you do that? Oh, that sounds wonderful. When I hear that, um, I just kind of drew on the culture I grew up in. I grew up in Los Angeles in um, a Mexican-American or Chicano family, middle of five children. Um, both my parents were born in Los Angeles in 1932, and my grandparents came from Mexico. They basically you know, escaped the violence of the revolution and started a new life in, in the United States around 1920. Um, and I, one of the things I tell students when I, when I meet students, high school or college, you know, I ask them, uh, what do you do if you don't tell your story? And they always get it. They, they always respond. Well, someone else is going to write it and it won't be right. So I'm writing my stories based on my family, based on my culture, based on people I've known. And, um, you know, there's one of the things that I know as a reader that I really appreciate, or when I watch a movie, um, if I see myself in literature or I see myself in a movie, there's a connection that is so validating. You know, growing up in the United States um, in the 60s and 70s, turn on the TV, English language TV, never really saw anyone, you know, like, like me or my family. You know, yes, there was I Love Lucy, right? There was Ricky Ricardo, but he, you know, that was almost the only expression that we saw um, of ourselves on, on TV. And he was not even Mexican. He was Cuban. <laughs> One of the other things that I think is important about what I try to do with my short fiction is I really enjoy creating short stories where I can just run with the ball and just kind of make every sentence count. I almost feel like writing short stories is like being a character actor. You know how a character actor, most character actors have very long careers because you know they'll do a movie and for that movie, they are like the villain. And then that character actor in the next movie, that, that, that character actor is like the hero. And they do different things and they pl put on different accents and they, 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 they can become someone else for a movie. Uh, for me, I almost feel like I'm becoming someone else in one of my short stories. Ah. And that keeps it fresh. It keeps it exciting for me because one of the worst things for me as a writer would be if I got bored. I'd never want to be bored. 
how can you be bored with all your stories? My gosh, anyone that picks up the book, <laughs> How to Date a Flying Mexican, is going to spend their time crying, laughing, remembering, <laughs> and just going to sort of like, what the heck is this going? But then you get to the end, it's like a novella. Oh my gosh, okay. Oh, wow. I didn't expect that ending. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's kind of funny because I, the reason why it feels like it's a wild ride is because that's how I approach my writing. Every story for me is a brand new adventure. I never know where a story is going to end when I start a brand new short story. Mm-hmm. I usually I usually come up with a title. I usually come up with like a concept early on, but then it develops on its own and the characters begin to come real. And once that starts to happen, it kind of takes on a natural kind of path. It develops on its own. And what's really funny in reading some of my stories, you know, I'll I'll read a story and I see a little tidbit and I'll remember, oh, at that time in my life, I was eating a lot of that kind of food or, or that was going on in the news and that's why, or that was happening with my son and that's why, you know, that issue is being discussed by those characters. And, um, or as my mom noted once, she said, you know, your stories are sort of like a history of LA because some of the, some of the places you mentioned don't exist anymore. In the time that the stories have been published, some, some of the restaurants don't exist, some of the stores don't exist. Um, so it's almost like a like a little bit of history, um, but that's just you know the the exciting part of writing short stories. You, you just put it all in there, and you go where it's going to take you. And and sometimes I'm surprised by the endings. When did you discover you're a writer? I was writing the moment I could spell words with a crayon. Um, my mom saved for me. One of my first little books, which I created, I probably was in second grade or something. And it was a it was a ghost story. And it was illustrated and had a little, every page had a little, you know, a few lines of dialogue and and you know, not a lot of um depth, but it was a kid's story. Um and I wanted just to tell stories, even from a very young age. So throughout grammar school, I was always involved in student publications in high school as well. I was also an artist, so I drew a lot of, you know, uh, illustrations um, for publications. Um, Even through college, I was art director of the Stanford Chaparral, which is the humor magazine. And I wrote cartoons and I drew illustrations. And, you know, um, uh, I, I was always telling stories. I was always trying to express myself did people try to say you know your stories are really out there you should stop you should you know become normal (laughs) no my parents um my parents were uh well my dad passed in 2020 uh my mom is still alive they were always big readers both of them um we were a family of books even when the money was tight we had our library cards um and they truly encouraged all five of their children to you know, to to read, to be creative. And it's kind of funny because, you know, by, by day I'm a government lawyer and my parents are proud that I went to law school. Um, but my parents were even prouder when I started publishing fiction. And it was... <laughs> they'll happily brag about, oh, he has a new book out. And, and you know... I'm, he's I'm a lawyer, sure, but... That he's a lawyer, but he has a, line, book, you know. he has a new book. And, <laughs> but, but that shows, that kind of shows how they just embraced and, and loved uh, you know creativity and books and, and telling stories. Uh, even from a young age, you know, we would we would go see movies, you know, um Zifarelli's um Romeo and Juliet. You know, that came out when I was like nine or something. And they took us to the theater to see that. You know, um in in when I was in college they bought tickets to the uh, um, um Zoot Suit, the play. Mm. Um, in Aquari- 19- Aquarius Theater mm-hmm. in 1978. I went I was, there. I went there. Yeah, I was 19 years old, and it was like, oh my god, this is just, and and you know, in the last few years, I, I have also become a playwright. I've had plays produced, and and for readings and also for the stage. Um, so, you know, it was the, that seed was already being planted. You know, when I was young, 
So they, they were always um, very, very much into telling stories, uh, reading, um, watching, um, watching plays and movies. Question comes up to not only authors, but performers and everyone else. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with rejection? Well, I've kept all my rejections and they just make me angry and I just fight even more to get published. And uh, yes, I've gotten fewer rejections as I've gotten older because I've become more and more published. Um, rejection uh, can be difficult. Um, uh, my, late, my late father had wanted to be a writer. Um, when he was a young parent, um, I'm the middle of five. So when I was a baby, he worked in a factory and my mom was a homemaker and he worked night shift. And so during the day, he, he, he was writing fiction and poetry on a little manual typewriter, um, a Royal Quiet Deluxe, the same model mm -hmm. or his same make that Hemingway loved, um, loved to use. And I have that now, I inherited it. He never got published. He was rejected repeatedly by the publishers. Um, and this was in the early sixties. And so he decided, well, okay, I guess I'm not gonna be a writer. He destroyed everything and he focused on education and right, you know, he eventually got his bachelor's degree and a master's degree and became a white collar worker. You know, the publishing industry has never ne been kind to people who don't, don't really fit a certain mold. And certainly back in the early sixties, the publishing industry was not very kind to the Chicano writer or Chicano writer. You know, um, and, uh, you know, I just kept in my mind that I was going to, um, I was going to get published. I might get rejected here, but someone's going to accept my stories and my writing. Someone is. And, you know, I just hung in there. But um, it can be discouraging because it's a very personal thing. You know, when you write a story or you write poetry or you write a play, if you're treating it as an artistic form, an artistic expression, you're really putting yourself out there. You're putting your heart and soul out there. And a rejection could, could really sting, could be a very personal kind of thing. But maybe because I'm a lawyer, I got a, thin, a thick skin. I got a pretty thick skin as a lawyer. And uh, maybe that helped me <laughs> hang in there. That's right. That's right. So you're putting the case forward. They say no. And you have to sort of you know, shrug your arms and move on. Or what's my next step? Your stories talk about morality, justice, and self-determinating. Mm -hmm. Why did you make those a priority? Well, it came very naturally. You know, when I look at life, and I look at the world and how people, how we navigate through the world, uh, particularly being raised, even though I'm not Catholic now, I was raised in, in the Roman Catholic religion, 12 years of Catholic school. Mm -hmm. I converted to Judaism in 1988. Religion and human foibles have been just a big part of what I've observed through life. In the end, I think an interesting story will address um, our humanity in all its different colors, in all its frailty, in all its strengths. And um, I think that a lot, some of the best storytelling confront some of our demons too. Now, in some of my stories, the demon actually appears. I actually have the devil appear, which um, um, I, I think is a very powerful symbol for the devils that are within us, the demons that we have, um, our imperfections. Um, I think all those things are fascinating. I think those are things that uh, my parents as religious people struggled with and think about. When I was very young, my dad used to read to me <laughs> a book which was gave me nightmares. It was the, the, I forget the exact title, but I think the title was something along the lines of The Lives of the Saints. And he would read these stories to me of the saints, you know, and some of these stories, you know, uh, there'd be a saint in bed and the devil would come and shake the bed and, and these horrible things would happen and just um wait a minute I, was he trying to put you to sleep with these stories or what? i don't know he was just reading these stories to me why is he reading these? i don't stories? know but it was you know he was a seminarian when he was young so so maybe there was just hey this is just part of life and so you know i kind of grew up with this all of this being kind of part of life so i, I anyway i think i think dealing with those issues uh, will make fiction more interesting than just dealing with more bland type of things. I just, I don't write bland. 
that's not part of my DNA. <laughs> bland, bland lawyer. Your lawyer day. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm an exciting lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think storytelling is part of being a lawyer. No, you're wrong. You're oh, wrong. I, oh my gosh. The best. Tell me, tell me. The best brief is a brief that tells a story. Oh. The, a lawyer who forgets that the audience is the person, a judge or a panel of judges or the Supreme Court. They're people. People can get bored by bad writing. People can be compelled by exciting writing, by writing that tells why you should win, that, that humanizes what the dispute is about. The best lawyers are uh, those who can tell a compelling story. So I beg to differ. <laughs> I'm glad you corrected me on that area. Let's all learn something brand new as I do as wonderful interviews. Now, I know you do presentations to other writers and also students as well. What's your take on advice for them? You know, how to sort of keep their motivation to go out and write and tell their story? Um, I have several bits of advice. First, don't get discouraged. It, you know, it can feel very difficult to make time to tell your story, to sit down and, and write. But, um, you know, there are times when you just need to do that. Um, the other thing is, it's important to read, you know, that's how I learned to become a writer. I didn't, I don't have an MFA. I have my BA in English literature, but I did not take any creative writing. And I have my law degree. And so when I started to write, I just immersed myself again in, in, in books I enjoyed, but also expanded my reading um, and to include, you know, Chicano and Chicana writers and, and other writers. Um, so, so a writer needs to read. Um, and when you read and you read voraciously, you begin to see what works. You know, you begin to see what touches you. And then you just need to dive in and write. The, probably one of the worst things you could do is, is, call, is call yourself a writer, but never, but never write. The wonderful Carolyn C., who was a great novelist who passed away a, a few years back, she had advice for writers you know she taught at UCLA and, and supported many other writers she said don't tell you know when you start writing you know when you just begin writing don't tell people you're writing just don't don't spread the word get something written finish a story and, and you know and then only then once you finish something and then you start sending it out if you want to tell people you know I, I'm writing now I'm not published yet but I'm writing uh she said the worst thing that that she could hear, you know, someone bragging about, oh, I'm going to write the great American novel. I'm going to do this and do that. And they never actually put the time in. And the other thing is don't let negative people turn you off to writing. I have read articles about uh, particularly, you know, writers of color in writing workshops being insulted and denigrated for the stories they're telling. You know, and, 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 and that's very unhealthy. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to listen to that, particularly if, if those type of negative comments are tinged with maybe not overt racism or bigotry, um, but perhaps an implicit bias um, about the kind of stories that we tell or the kind of cultural touchstones we put into our stories. Try to find a writing community that is, that is supportive. Go to writing conferences and, and try to meet other writers. Uh, I know I have over the years, I've been very lucky. I've, I've gone to conferences, I've gotten to know people. I interview them for various publications. I know, I know which ones are good people. Every so often there's someone out there who is not, who's jealous or is not very supportive. Uh, that, that's my advice to, to young people who are just beginning. I have a piece of advice I read somewhere and I have taken it to heart. He says, never piss off a writer in mysteries and in murder because they will absorb you into the story and murder you. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that one. That's, that's interesting. Um, I, 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 I never thought about that. I, um, 
I guess I'm a little careful about that, considering the fact that I am a lawyer and I didn't want to want to be sued by someone saying, you know, you put that horrible person in that story. <laughs> you change your name, but it's you, and you know it's, yeah, it's you. Know. Hey, wait a minute, I got murdered in that story. <laughs> I, uh, so I'm very careful around people that write that particular kind of story. <laughs> That's funny. I think, uh, I think I find in you one moment I'm crying and next moment I'm laughing. And I think that's very Latino. Mm. You know, I, I've been in, a, you know, when I go to funerals, unfortunately here in Mexico, sometimes, you know, one moment everybody's, oh my God. And they're outside and then they're cracking up about, and even telling jokes about the person that died. I see, you know, did you know that, you know, mm -hmm. oh my God. And everybody starts laughing. And I always thought about it. What's going on? It's just the culture. It, it, it sort of, uh, it lets go of the pressure. It lets go of the catharsis of, uh, and that's what I picked up in your book. Yeah, it's all wrapped up in life, right? The the great sorrow and the great the great uh, hilarity of life. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of mixed up, and sometimes it's all mixed up within the same moment. And I think, yeah, I think it's part of the culture. You know, um, I think certain cultures you see that you see it. I think you see it in the Italian culture. I think you mm -hmm. see it with the Irish. You know, so there are certain cultures where you see laughing and crying is just kind of happening at the same time. You know, I just try to express how my family confronted life. I What I like about this interview is that you're talking to other writers and you're telling them, if you don't write, who's going to hear your story? Right, right. And, and also, if I don't write on a personal point, if I don't write, you know, I'll go crazy. You know, I, I feel like there are these voices, and I might sound a little crazy right now, you know, I my characters are very real to me. And so when I started thinking of a character at a certain point, you know, my wife would say, you know, I think you need to go right. Cause she can tell, <laughs> she can tell that the characters <laughs> fight in my head. And, and, and so I have to get it out. And th I think that's part of the creative process. I think people who are painters or people who are writers or, or musicians, if you don't get it out, if you don't try to express it, you know, you feel as if your head's going to explode and, and you don't feel right. You feel, you feel out of sorts, you know, something feels wrong. Um, and I think someone who is not an artist kind of wonders, what? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I, and, and I guess to the, those people, I say, imagine your most absolute favorite activity, but you're just not allowed to do it. You, you begin to get thrown off. So I, and, and one of the things I'm very lucky uh, when it comes to writing is that, you know, I don't have to do it. I do it because it gives me joy and it happens to also entertain people and, and, and makes a connection with people um, and means something to people. So I'm just very lucky. Two questions come to mind. Are children born naturally creative in their storytelling? And there are things that happen that sort of deaden that opportunity. My second point is, as a writer, whether let's take you back to an unsuccessful writer, okay, hypothetically, and you keep writing and writing and writing, you've mm -hmm. got piles of stories in there. Don't you still nevertheless meet a lot of great people and talk about the stories back and forth and have fun just doing that? Yes. And, and it's funny, there is a conundrum, you know. There have been wonderful writers who died impoverished and then eventually, you know, their, their work is discovered. And the strange thing is a person who has no talent can truly believe in their work. A person who has talent can truly believe in their work, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and who's to say, you know, who's the, um, who's, who's the true artist? Um, you know, that, that's a conundrum because um, I believe in my work, but maybe I'm delusional. I don't know. <laughs> of course you are. You're a writer. You have to be. I'm a writer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I figure I, um, if I'm delusional, a few other people are delusional because they keep on publishing me. So I'm lucky. <laughs> I find other crazy people. Isn't that the point? Isn't yes, that ultimately point. the end of the day to find those other crazy people that understand the craziness of what you're writing? Yeah. Right. And one of the other points I want to make, too, is I've been able, I don't have an agent, so I find the publishers on my own. And my publishers throughout the years have been wonderful. The publisher of this book, the University of Nevada Press, 
they have been so wonderful and so supportive of, of um, the stories I'm trying to tell. And the stories that make up this collection had been pro published pre previously by uh, the University of uh, Arizona Press, Bilingual Press, which is out of ASU. And, you know, those publishers, all those publishers have been publishing, you know, Latino and Latina writers for years and years and years, for decades. They believe in the work that we do. I just say God bless publishers who are willing to take a chance because it costs money to, you know, to put a book out. It, it takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of a lot of heartbreak, a lot of tears sometimes if you, you know, can't get enough reviews. Um, so I give, I give all the publishers a lot of credit and uh, University of Nevada Press in particular, you know, they published uh, Marcelo Montoya recently in his, his most recent novel, um, Ishtar Maya Murray, who is, um, who is also a law professor and a novelist. Oh, wow. You know, you know <laughs> and Ishtar teaches at Loyola Law School here in LA. And she actually blurred me and she's one of the people I was reading early on uh, when I first started writing who inspired me to be a writer. Thank goodness there are publishers who are willing to take a chance. Daniel, where can our viewers find your information, your books, present and future, and keep up with all the great activities you're doing? Well, my website is very simple. It's uh, danielolivas.com. And um, I'm on Twitter at Olivas Dan, O L I V A S D A N. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Just type in my name, I'll pop right up. <laughs> and uh, people, people can find me. And I also write for a bunch of different publications. I write for La Bloga, uh, which covers um, Latinx literature and the arts uh, for almost two decades or longer. Um, I write for the LA Review of Books. I write for, I'm going to be writing now for. Alta Journal, I have a piece coming out very soon, uh, Thursday in fact. So um, um, I'm out and about, just Google my name, you'll, you'll find me. Okay, one final question on the personal level, when the heck do you- So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't golf, a lot of lawyers golf. So, <laughs> so you take all those hours of golfing and I'm writing a short story instead. <laughs> and I have Fair. a very supportive, I have a supportive wife, um, my, my law school sweetheart. Um, Sue Formaker, who's wonderful, and um, she's she is an administrative law judge, and she she um, we've been together forty years, so I'm very uh -huh. lucky. I'm, I'm a very blessed man. And then our son Ben, who's um, he's a creative guy who uh, is a video game designer, and uh, he's always kept us on our toes. Uh, he's now thirty one years old, so uh, he's he's not such a little kid now. <laughs> Hey, video plane may become part of the Olympics from what I understand. I know, that's right. <laughs> it's a whole new world. It's a definitely a whole new world. I'd like to get into, unfortunately, coming to the end, uh, mm -hmm. your closing statements. And I, I mean, I could go for hours with this interview, but you know, I've got to respect the time. But I'd like to hear your closing statements. So we're not on this earth for a very long time. And the older I get, the more I feel that. So. You know, if you want to create, if you want to tell your story, and you want to tell the story of your people, don't delay, don't wait, don't say, I'll do it when I retire. Um, you just don't know how long you're gonna be on this earth. Do it now, write your stories now. There'll be people who will listen, people who will support you. So that's why I tell folks, you know, do it now. Then you'll leave us author. <laughs> how to date a flying Mexican, I love the title. <laughs> Daniel, I wish success. I hope you keep writing forever. And, you know, you leave your ideas on paper, on books for future generations. And that's the part we may not appreciate that. Like you say, you know, you write something, anyone writes something. Nobody, no one may read it today. And then, you know, 60 years later, discovered that's one of the great masterpieces. That's unfortunately what has happened on this planet many a times. And so thank you. Thank you for um, encouraging us, whether we write a sentence as, as part of our story or whether we write a whole book. You've, I feel supported in the idea that we need to get the, our ideas from here into some form of paper or digital. Let people enjoy it. So, and you did that with your wonderful, wonderful book. How to date a flying Mexican it made me laugh. That was hilarious. 
<laughs> but you also made me cry in your other story. So I've got to Good. Enjoy. Anyone that picks it up is going to enjoy themselves. And you uh, get lost in your story. It is beautiful. Thank you very much for the stories. Thank you, Romano. And thank you for all the support you give to, to writers. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Look forward to having you on future shows. And once again, just before we close, where is your website? DanielOlivas.com. And then on Twitter at OlivasDan. Very easy to find. Daniel, continuous success and keep not only writing, but also telling people write, write, and write. Adios. Adios.